clearly off to a good start so far. All right, so hormone replacement and supplementation. Um, in an endocrine experiment, controlling the levels of the hormone to uh, <clears throat> recognize or to realize an effect is pretty important. Okay, so uh, again, replacement, supplementation, two different things. Replacement, if we completely lost the hormone, we can put it back in. Uh, supplementation is this idea that we're going to provide additional hormone if hormone, the hormone is already uh, are already occurred. So we would use a replacement strategy after surgery. And there's a variety of different ways that this has been done. Uh, one of the ways is called a tissue extract. And tissue extracts are going to be this process where we take, uh, excise out a endocrine producing tissue and we grind that up so we take the tissue out we grind it up and then we're going to extract that material that we ground up the ground tissue extract through a solvent end up with a solution that has uh, whatever the solvent has pulled out of that endocrine producing tissue. So maybe it's pulled out the, um, the hormone, or hopefully it's pulled out the hormone, and then we can give that to an individual, uh, like a, a research animal, and we can observe what happens. The setback here is that it's, it's a crude prep, which just means we're not preparing a pure sample. So, for example, if we were to take this tissue and tissue, grind that up, we may get testosterone, but we're going to get other molecules as well. And so, if we're interested in what's happening or what the effects of testosterone are, we have some, um, with this particular technique, some ambiguity in the approach, because it may actually be attributed to the observation may be attributed to a, a, another molecule that's within within the, the solvent or the extract. Another approach is an approach known as a silastic implant. So silastic, um, silastic is a material it's produced by the Dow Corning Company, uh, their Dow Chemical. Uh, and it, it's a porous type uh, substance. And they can form it into a variety of different shapes. Most commonly, you'll have a silastic tube. So you can purchase elastic tubing, and it's going to have uh, a porous structure. And you can go and pack that, that tubing full of a purified steroid or hormone. Uh, so pack it full of testosterone or pack it full of uh, insulin. And so you're using a more purified substance. Commercially available hormones right now, you can buy them from places like Sigma Aldrich, and they'll be 99% pure, meaning that they're 99% of the molecule that you're interested in. Most of them come in a powdered format. And so you can either deliver that powdered hormone directly into the cyanastic implant, or you can dissolve it in some sort of um, uh, some sort of solvent. So to make these, you basically cut the silastic implant or the silastic tubing to a known length. You also are going to know uh, both the inside and the outside diameter, so you can calculate things like the total amount of hormone that goes inside of the animal. So you fill the tubing with your specific hormone. And then it's a 
quick surgery to implant that uh, that tubing into uh, into a research animal. For controls, there's a variety of different approaches. You can just put in an empty capsule, so you're just exposing the animal to the silastic tubing. Uh, sometimes you'll use a, a vehicle, and you'll just use the vehicle inside of the implant for your control animal. So maybe you'll dissolve in uh, some sort of oil, you know, some uh, some flower seed oil, pretty common arachis seed oil is a pretty common vehicle for wet and molecules, and so you load that uh, that vehicle with oil into the implant without any um, testosterone or the other form of consolidant. Now, both of the ends of the tubing are going to typically be capped off, and we'll cap them off with like a weather stripping or a caulk. Allow those to dry up so nothing's going to come out of the end, nothing's going to come off of the, uh, out of the pores of the silastic tubing. Again, these are surgically implanted. Typically, a subcutaneous approach is going to be used here. They're just below the surface of the skin, a lot of times we'll put them on the, the dorsum or on the on the neck of the animal, so they really can't reach that by trying to pull them out. And what you end up with is, as long as you're very consistent in the way that you produce individual capsules, you're going to get delivery at a constant, estimatable rate. The, the advantages here of the silastic implant is they're very inexpensive. We can literally make thousands of these for a couple bucks. But the trade-off is, is that it's an estimated rate, so it's not an exact known rate. And so you do have to do some follow-up in terms of assaying for uh, the hormone in these animals. An alternative is what's known as an osmotic pump, and that's what's shown here on the board. So this is a device that has multiple membranes, and you basically have a, uh, a chamber on the inside that you load up with your hormone of interest dissolved in some sort of salt. This gets implanted subcutaneously. That's what you can see here in this wrap, someplace like the dorsum on the back of the neck. And the outer membrane, which is a pervious membrane, uh, a semi-permeable membrane, and then you have kind of this space, and then there's an impervious or impermeable membrane on the inside. That body fluid flows into that uh, space between the inner and the outer membrane. It puts pressure on that internal reservoir, and that pressure creates a constant flow. And we actually know, based off of uh, the the specific device the exact delivery. Okay, so there's a little map here, but you can get very exact delivery rates. You can get it right within um, a physiological range, just like replacing the oral cells, say you remove ovaries, and you want to replace estradiol. You can use an osmotic pump, and you can um, deliver that estradiol uh, almost to an exact um, replication of the ovary if it was still in place. So there's a lot of advantages here. The one major disadvantage with the osmotic pump is they're very expensive. A typical study, if you have 20 animals, you'll get about $2,500 for 20 different capsules. So these are, again, small capsules. Very similar approach that we use with the silastic implant. Fill those up with uh, your hormone solution, your hormone dissolved in some sort of dilutant. Surgically implanted, it's basically <clears throat> a very similar surgical procedure that we would use to implant uh, the silastic implant. It's going to provide. 
provide us that very precise uh, predetermined dose. But they are quite a bit more in some cases. That's the point. So that's kind of your trade off. Now, to be perfectly honest, <clears throat> with the silastic implants, with experience, you actually can get pretty good at setting up mixtures where you dial in a pretty good uh, a, a pretty good estimated dose. So even though you're not as exact ever with the with a silastic implant as you can be with a, a, a osmotic pump, we can get really close to having a pretty consistent delivery that's not really super physiological for some reason. Pretty close to that physiological range. So I use silastic implants mostly. Um, we've looked at for future studies. Another option for providing hormones are just simple injections. Now with injections, these are a lot more, um, a lot more, <clears throat> require a lot more contact. Um, a lot of the hormones to maintain a adequate level of circulation you may actually have to have daily daily contact. Now, this becomes a little bit of a problem because daily contact with a lot of our research organisms, especially the rodents like rats and mice, this induces a stress response. So you have this covariate that comes into your experiments that's really hard to control. Um, sometimes injections are the way you have to go. There's really no other feasible alternative, and so injections may be may be required, like you've got to be cognizant that you are causing this, uh, this contact bias or this experimental bias. Uh, in, in a lot of our physiological um, variables that we look at, you will, you will noticeably um, be able to, to pinpoint when an individual is um, contacted for the animal because of behavioral change that can be observed. Another issue with injection is you a lot of times have what's known as an initial transient spike. An initial transient spike. Basically, um, the initial dose that you give, or, or when you give that dose, <clears throat> when, you, when you give the injection, <clears throat> levels skyrocket. And they kind of spike, and then they kind of level off. And so it's not a real consistent exposure. You have pretty good spike. So you might see levels that jump up and then they kind of level out with time. And so we have we have a kind of a temporal issue that, that can come into play. So that level of exposure to your specific hormone is going to decrease over time after that initial transient spike. So those are three different options that we have to take a look at replacing or supplementing hormones to research animals. Um, each of them kind of has their advantage and their disadvantage. And so you're just as a researcher trying to balance those things to get the, the most optimal, um, the most optimal situation for whatever you're trying to initially accomplish. So another thing that's really important in an endocrine study is the ability to measure hormone levels. And there are actually a number of techniques that are suitable for this. Um, we've already talked a little bit about quantification if you look at the, uh, the, the yellow and the person experiment with the development of the, the radio amino enzyme. Uh, and so that's one option. The, the, what I see more commonly is a technique that's known in the EIA or an ELISA. So these are more common today. And, and technically they are really two names for, for two different uh, two different things, or I'm sorry, two different names for the same thing. So EIA stands for enzyme immunosorbent, uh, or enzyme immunoassay, where the ELISA is 
stands for enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. Okay, so there's a variety of different types of EIAs or ELISAs. Um, a sandwich EIA is actually pretty common to um, uh, quantify or estimate circulating or tissue levels of specific hormones. And so basically what you have is you're going to have some, some sort of uh, extract that you take from the organs. Blood's pretty common. Um, that you can then produce the plasma or sera from that blood. You can take tissue samples and grind that up and do some sort of extraction procedure for fecal material for a variety of our different um, hormones. And so you, you basically get a biological sample and you prep that so that you have a solution that hopefully contains most of the hormone or all of the hormone from that, from all of your individual tissues. And that's what you expose to the ELISA, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. So over here, this is a sandwich, um, a sandwich ELISA. They, they are done in 96 well plates. I don't know if you've all seen a 96 well plate before, but basically it's a plate that's about this big, and you have eight, um, eight different rows and then 12 different columns. And each well is typically about 300 to 350 microliters. Okay. In those wells, so if we look at an individual well, that's what you kind of see here down at the bottom, at the very bottom of the well. You can't see it clearly, but the idea is, is that there's going to be some sort of antibody called the capture antibody. And that's going to be bound up through some sort of substrate binding material to the bottom of that well. The wells are made out of plastic typically. And we bind those capture antibodies so that they're stuck. They're not going to be removed, uh, or they should not be removed from the bottom of that plate. And so what you do is you take your target protein or your target lipid or hormone, whatever you're working with. Hopefully that's been extracted effectively from your sera, your fecal material, your tissue extract. And you put that solution inside of that well. And so the, the target protein or the, the target enzyme goes inside of that well. The capture antibody is programmed against that specific, uh, that specific molecule of interest. This is part of your, you know, part of an immune system, right? And so antibodies, they peg whatever foreign object is exposed to, um, exposed inside of, inside of the system. So in this case, that capture antibody is programmed against some sort of target, and it'll bind that target, basically flag it or tag it, and hold on to it, captures it. And so now you have that target protein kind of captured on that capture antibody as well, creates a covalent interaction. Hopefully that's not going to get washed away or removed either. Now the other thing that you normally will do here is you'll add in um, typically some sort of tracer that has, uh, that has a competitive nature will also bind to the, um, bind to the, the, the antibody. <clears throat> and so you end up developing this relationship where you're going to have some enzymes that get blocked by your hormone of interest and others that end up binding that then you can have other molecules come on, like a detection antibody that comes in and it binds to that structure. And then that detect detection antibody is a lot of times uh, either itself linked to some sort of enzyme or another antibody comes in and hits that second antibody and it's linked to an enzyme, okay? So you're setting up this situation where you capture your hormone of interest or you capture another molecule. And so there's kind of this inverse relationship. The more hormone of interest you have, the less of this other detection molecule you have, or vice versa. And so then your detection antibody comes on. Nothing probably is going to bind here, but it'll bind to the other molecule. And then there's an enzyme that's attached to that second or even sometimes a third antibody. 
Is this kind of making sense? And so now I can give that enzyme its substrate. So in this case, over here in this picture, it's HR, which is horse radish, horse, horse radish peroxidase. So it's a peroxidase that's found in horse radish. Peroxidase takes things like hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, and converts it over into um, water and, and oxygen. There's also substrates that you can give horseradish peroxidase that when horseradish peroxidase splits that molecule, it gives off a photon. And so that's what we're going to get to detect is either that photon of light that's created, or sometimes you have <clears throat> another molecule that when you break it apart, it changes the color of the solution. And then you can read that on what's called a microplate reader. You can detect the amount of light that's being produced, or you can detect a change in color. And based off of the relationship between your molecule of interest and that detection antibody, you then can use known standards to set up a regression line and take your unknown concentrations, run them through that regression line, and make an estimation or a prediction on how much hormone was present in that cell. Okay? So those are ELISA's or EIA. And the specific example there is a um, is a sandwich antibody. So I probably should have given you a whole bunch of notes on that. So maybe I will because I wrote them down. So let's go through it again because I know it's pretty complex. So first you're going to have your hormones extracted from some sort of some sort of starting material. So it might be a tissue of interest, or it might be from the blood, or from fecal material, or from saliva, or from urine. Okay, so you have some place that you start from where you extract your hormone of interest from that tissue, or from that bodily fluid. A typical extraction protocol for something like a tissue is you're going to homogenize, which just simply means you break up the physical structure of that tissue, and then you expose it to an organic or aqueous uh, extraction technique or extraction extraction solution. And so you're pulling out that hormone of interest based off of its chemical characteristics, and then you re-dilute it or concentrate it into um, an, an analyte, a solution that's going to be exposed to the to the assay. So basically, right here, we're basically just saying we're purifying that hormone so that we can so that we can look at that hormone and we don't have to worry about all the other stuff that's in there, all the protein, connected protein, and things like that. microplate is going to be conjugated with what's known as the capture or the primary antibody. In the world of cell biology, that's typically abbreviated as what looks like what you read. That just means primary. So it's going to be this primary antibody that's programmed to bind your molecule or your hormone of interest. A lot of times these antibodies are going to be produced in a specific organism like maybe a donkey or a rabbit and then we extract them out and so uh, they'll be programmed in the donkey to respond to testosterone, to respond to insulin, to respond to glucagon. What they bind to is known as an epitope. This is a part of the molecule, a sequence of amino acids or a sequence of molecules in a lipid that that antibody will bind to. And so they bind to a, a specific epitope. And that epitope is going to be specific to your molecule of interest. And that's kind of how you get the specificity here, is you're dialing into a very specific region on that molecule. So the result here, when you expose that hormone extract to those primary antibodies, is that primary antibody captures the hormone. And 
Now, when we put that hormone solution in there, we're not just putting it in the hormone. We have other stuff. We have our extraction buffer or our analyte, whatever we put in. And so we have to get rid of the stuff that didn't bind, that wasn't hormone, or wasn't molecule of interest. And so there's a, always going to be a washing step. And this washing step is done to remove the other stuff or the debris. And so hopefully by this point in the process, we have our hormone of interest that's bound up to our capture or our primary animal. And everything else has been removed. That's going to be read secondary. We've got two degrees here. It's supposed to be the degree symbol. Secondary antibody will bind to the captured hormone. And a lot of times this will bind on that captured hormone to a second epitope, a second region of that hormone. And so you have basically, basically have antibodies that are programmed, two different antibodies programmed against your hormone of interest. They both bind on different regions of that antibody. A lot of times that detection antibody is going to be conjugated to another molecule itself. It'll have that enzyme attached on to it or fluorescent tag attached on to it. Sometimes there's this other um, marker antibody, like we see in this picture, that will bind out to the detection antibody. Either way, the end of this reaction, you now are going to have conjugated and attached to your hormone of interest a label, whether it's through the detection antibody itself or a third antibody that's used in the system. You now have that hormone labeled. Let me spell label correctly. It's epitope. I have no idea how I got the D in there. Epitope. Second epitope conjugated to some sort of label. So now your hormone is basically attached to a tracer that can fluoresce. So a fluorescent tracer, or maybe it's an enzyme. And so we can stimulate that fluorescent tracer at the right wavelength, and it'll give off light. We can detect that light, or we give the enzyme the right substrates, and it converts the, uh, the substrate into product, and we can visually see or detect some sort of change in that product. These are supposed to be arrows. No, no. I, I, I'm just saying here, on our fluorescent tracer, it will glow. Here, with our enzyme, we'll give it substrate, convert that substrate to product, the product changes in some way, changes the color in the well, gives off light itself, whatever the case may be. That's supposed to be spelled fluorescent. I'm not quite there, but that's okay. Fluorescent. It was pretty close. Um, before we actually do that process of getting the light to fluoresce or change, the, allow the enzyme to change substrate to product, we do another step here of washing. And so in theory, by this point, by the second washing stage, you should just have your hormone, your detection antibody, and the enzyme of the fluorescent tank. That should really be the only thing captured inside of that well. Can undergo then this incubation step where we provide the substrate. Or in the case of fluorescent tags, it may be just hitting it with a beam of light that causes the fluorescence to begin. And so we, we, we stimulate the system so that the tracer or the enzyme are activated. And then once that tracer or that enzyme is activated, some, 
nothing happens. So in the case of a fluorescent, it's called fluorochrome. This produces light. In the scenario that I've just described here, if we're using a fluorescent detection system, since we are in a basically one-to-one -one relationship between our hormone and the light-producing fluorochrome, we would have a direct relationship between the monohormone and the monolight that's produced. So more light that's produced means more hormone, less light means less hormone. For fluorescent. Yes, it's abbreviation for fluorescent. In the case of an enzyme, we would provide a substrate, and that chemical reaction would occur. The substrate would be converted to product, and as that product is accumulated in the well, it does something to the solution that's inside of the well. So we'll a lot of times have a colorimetric change, right? We'll start out and we'll be yellow. And then we put the substrate in there. And if we have high amounts of strut substrate, which means we have high amounts of our protein of interest, it shifts the color to blue. And then we can use a detection device to measure how blue the substrate or how blue the well became. So the bluer it became, the more enzyme was present. That particular process would be measured on a device that's known as a microplate reader. Microplate reader. And basically the way that this works is I have my solution inside of here that has changed to color. In the microplate reader, I have a light source. I send that light source through and it's typically filtered. Right, so there's like a filter right here, and that filter would be, uh, let's say it's a 420 nanometer filter, and so it filters all, all light except for 420 nanometers. And so I'm giving a very specific, uh, 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 very specific wavelength, passing that through the substance, and the more color change that you have, the more of that light that's going to be absorbed. Right, so some of it is absorbed, which means that over here on the other side of the well, where I have a detector, I'm going to have a different amount of light depending on how much change has occurred. And so I know how much light is being initiated through the sample, how much is being detected on the other side of the sample, and that difference can be used to determine how much absorbance or how much transmittance through the sample was a lot. Okay? And so then I end up with these numbers that um, relate to my unknowns or the samples I'm trying to detect. And I'll run them against the standard curve of known concentrations of my hormone. And I use the concentration plus the absorbance values for um, those known standards. And I develop a curve. Right? A lot of times it's you know, something like that where concentration is kind of graphed here on the, on the x, absorbance up here on the y. And then I can take my known absorbances, take them on up to the line, and I can plot down to the estimate of the concentration. Now, just like every other area of biology, endocrinology has not been uh, isolated from modern genomics. So genetics and genomics techniques are also now very widely used. And you might read endocrine papers where they're looking at um, genetic sequences, where they're looking at messenger RNA transcription through techniques like PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, cellular techniques like Western blot looking for 
uh, another way to quantify the amount of material that's being produced. Uh, and so there's a whole host of genetic and genomic techniques that are now being used in endocrinology, but this is common in all of the fields in biology. No, there's no field in biology that's not getting separated from, uh, from a genetic or a genomic uh, use of technology. Okay. I know that was really fast. Those are some basic techniques that we can use to manipulate an endocrine system to try to understand what's happening. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to move on to um, chapter number three. Spend a couple days dealing with what's known as hormone action. So hormone action is basically how an individual hormone causes or facilitates a change in another cell or tissue. How do we go from the hormone to the physiological change or the behavioral change that we can observe? So I'd recommend that you kind of look at some new, um, some new lecture notes here, start your notes over. If you want to call it something, call it something awesome like hormone action. Okay, so we have to look at, in, at individual cells and individual cells' ability to respond to a hormone is wrapped up in the presence of that cell having a receptor that can interact with the hormone. So in order to see a response in a specific cell type, you have to have that receptor. That receptor has to interact with, with the hormone. Okay? So if a cell does not have a specific hormone receptor, does it respond to that hormone? It does not. If it has the receptor, it does respond, or it should respond. And so even though hormones are released out into circulation, and they go absolutely everywhere, because of the presence of receptors on the cell membrane or within the cell, you end up with very specific cell types that can respond to specific hormones. And these receptors are actually very specific. very specific receptors. And these receptors, they end up in a variety of different locations within individual cells. So some of these specific receptors, they may be bound in the membrane. And they can come in both uh, transmembrane proteins or peripheral proteins, right? So it could be a, a peripheral receptor that's just kind of near uh, the surface or on the surface of the cell, or sometimes they go all the way through, all the way through the core column. But we can also have cells where the receptors are considered intracellular. And so that means they are not associated with the membrane. We find them basically free within either the cytoplasm or the nucleus of the cell. And so some of the intracellular proteins qualify or are classified as cytoplasmic and some of them are nuclear. And that just is a description of where they are located inside of the cell. Cytoplasmic or nuclear. So one of the early questions in terms of endocrinology research is where are the receptors located for our hormone of interest? And the way that this was initially determined was through a technique that's known as a sephirose bead assay. Okay, you maybe have never run into sephirose before, but you definitely can tell me what kind of molecule it is. Yeah, it's carbohydrate. OSC on the end of it. So basically, we take this sugar called sephirose and we can kind of form a, a, a bead like structure. And then a lot of times, these beads are conjugated or attached to our hormone. And what ends up happening is the hormone 
now is too big because of that Sephiroth's B to be able to cross through the member. Okay? So the, the, the idea here with the Sephiroth's bead assay is we attach the Sephiroth's bead to our hormone of interest, and because of its overall size, it prevents entrance of that hormone into the cells. So a lot of times this was done in some sort of cell culture. We would have a specific cell type that we thought responded to uh, hormones or that we knew responded to a specific hormone. We culture those cells in, in culture plates, and then we would perform the sephiroth bead assay. And basically, we would look for some sort of physiological change. So maybe we try to detect a molecular change, or maybe we look for some sort of characteristic of that cell to change that we're expecting to change if the hormone um, initiated that change. Whatever the response was, if we saw a response, then we were pretty certain that that membrane had receptors bound up in it. And in addition, that those receptors were bound in the extracellular fluid phase of that membrane. Okay. Whereas we have no response, oops. if we have no response, then it's most likely that that receptor is intracellular. And so a lot of times we would approach those questions if we give certain cells or specific cells, the hormone without the saccharose bead, the hormone, some of the cells, the hormone with the saccharose bead, and we'd look to see if we got responses or no responses in that uh, experimental system. So with a response with the saccharose bead in place, we typically knew that it was due to probably be membrane bound. Without the response, then we knew that it probably was intracellular. And if especially if we ate hormone without the bead and it responded, when it didn't respond with the bead, then we're pretty sure that that membrane has to be crossed in order for the, um, in order for the hormone to take its effect. But there is still some uncertainty because there's actually two reasons that you could have a response. First reason relates to receptor number. So if we have a response, we could be dealing with receptor number, and that receptor number is regulation. And so it's possible that we provide that hormone and then something happens where that cell self-regulates itself. This is what's known as a homo-specific response. So we bind the receptor, and self-regulation occurs. We have this homospecific response. And so it's some other molecule that's being produced that causes some sort of change in that particular form on the particular cell system. So for example, when we increase prolactin, Prolactin results in an increase in the number of prolactin receptors. In the liver. Whereas with, for example, insulin.
we increase insulin, we decrease the number of insulin receptors. So when we have a response, it's possible that we could be altering the number of receptors, which means that we alter the response. And so you get prolactin, you increase the number of prolactin receptors, and more prolactin responds bigger. Whereas with insulin, we decrease the number of insulin receptors, and so we get more insulin, and we lose the response. Another option is that the hormone regulates another hormone's receptor. And so maybe really the hormone is causing an effect, but the effect is to regulate another hormone's receptor and then that hormone causes a physiological change inside of the cell system. This is what's known as a heterospecific response. So for example, if I provided progesterone, actually decrease the number of estrogen receptors. And so progesterone follows this heterospecific response and is actually modifying not a progesterone-based behavior or physiological response, but an estrogenic response. And so I may actually not see any changes with progesterone and think, oh, Okay, well, is that an intracellular, or is it just because I'm actually modifying the number of estrogen receptors, and then if I had estrogen in there, I'd also see a change, or I would then see a change in the estrogenic effect. So for an example here of a response based off of the number of receptors, if I provide insulin, I end up reducing receptor number. And so now the response will actually change because I have less receptor numbers as we stimulate with insulin again. And so this this change with insulin or this change in receptor number, the response isn't identical every time because you have this, this change that's occurring. So this can be confusing, right, for uh, initial observations on whether or not we have an intracellular or a membrane bound. But even beyond that, there's implications biologically and physiologically as well. So, for example, exercise and diet, which result in decreases in blood sugar, or drugs that we can provide, may actually result in decreases in insulin, which results in increases in receptor number, And so now we have a different response that will occur if we give insulin to an organism or uh, into cells that were cultured from a rat that has just exercised because we have different insulin numbers. Now the other response that occurs is related to the overall concentration of the hormone. As a general rule, most 
of our receptors, if we're right around about 5% or more of those receptors bound, and actually that's probably the wrong way. That says less than. So if we're equal to or greater than 5% of the receptors that are bound, this normally leads to a, 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 noticeable, a noticeable biological response. And so if we didn't put in enough to get to that magic 5% number, we may not actually see a response. Okay? So with the Cephros bead assay, we can determine to a certain degree how the horm a specific hormone, um, uh, how it interacts with receptors, where that receptor is located, with the caveat that there are going to be some changes that may occur that change how the response occurs. And also, we have to hit uh, a reasonable concentration. And so we can't be below that 5% number. Um, and if we go way above it, we may have super physiological conditions that results in non-biological response, responses that normally would not happen in biology. Okay? So for the most part, we know um, a good number of our hormones where the receptors are located. Well, we are discovering new things every day. Um, so one of the places that has kind of come up over the last 10, 15 years that's pretty interesting is originally we kind of thought, okay, since estrogen and testosterone, since they're lipophilic, they probably cross through the membrane and interact with either cytosolic or cytoplasmic receptors or nucleus-based receptors, but we're now beginning to find receptors in the membrane, a lot of the G-link type protein systems that respond to both testosterone and estrogen as well. Um, and so it kind of opens up multiple pathways that could be causing the effects that you're seeing inside of, inside of your system or, or in your, your changes in physiology. So let's talk a little bit about membrane binding and what the membrane um, the membrane bound receptors. And we're going to start out with structure. Let's start out with structure. And you've all seen some, uh, something similar to this in the past. Uh, these are transmembrane proteins, and you have single and multi-pass proteins, and you have different um, tertiary and quaternary structures that can develop, and they all result in different anatomical uh, uh, or, or morphological features. And we know that the anatomy and the morphology drive what happens functionally. So structurally, both single pass and multi-pass receptors are present, right? So transmembrane, either single pass or then multi-pass, as you can see over here and here. Taking it a step further. We've identified four general families for our receptors, or four endocrine-related receptors. The first general family, and we'll go through uh, some examples here a little bit later. But the first general family of receptors are receptors that are enzymes. So for example, tyrosine kinase receptors. Uh, these are receptors that phosphorylate tyrosines. The second general class or family are receptors that are channels. The third general class or general family are receptors to two proteins. And then the final class are receptors with unknown mechanisms of transduction. And 
so as more has learned about some of these receptors in this final class, they probably get reclassified into one of these others, uh, one of these other general families. All right, so let's take a look at the first uh, family, the receptors that are enzymes. And the example I'm going to give here is the insulin receptor. Okay, so here is the <clears throat> insulin receptor. And what you can see is the insulin receptor has multiple subunits, and there's actually two different, um, two different units that come together made up of the two different subunits. So we have an alpha subunit, which is what actually binds to the insulin, and then we have a beta subunit that it turns out is uh, tyrosine kinase uh, part of the subunit. Okay, so with the insulin receptor, if insulin levels increase, cells that have insulin receptors can be bound by insulin. So insulin binds. And when insulin binds, right, so what, what's our general rule about proteins binding? things like receptors or enzymes, when a protein binds something, it causes that something to change its shape, which results in a change in function, right? So in this case, insulin binds initiating a shape change, and the shape change leads to a, a functional change in which that insulin receptor can go through a process known as autophosphorylation. Autophosphorylation. And just based off of the name, you probably have already guessed that the beta subunit here is going to phosphorylate itself, or the two beta subunits are going to phosphorylate um, each other. So insulin binds induces this ability to undergo autophosphorylation. The <clears throat> enzyme activity is a tyrosine kinase type activity. And so basically, with the, with, on the insulin uh, <clears throat> beta subunits, we have tyrosine kinase, or enzymatic patches, where tyrosine amino acid residues will be phosphorylated up the kinase. Autophosphorylated, so you get a bunch of um, phosphates that end up on the beta subunits. With that activity enhanced, we actually have the ability to also phosphorylate other molecules within the cell. In the case of insulin, we have a protein that's called the IRS, the insulin response substrate. Normally, that sits inside of the cell in an inactive inactive form. When insulin binds to the insulin receptor, autophosphorylation is induced. We now gain the ability to phosphorylate other molecules in the cell, and, ins and this insulin receptor substrate or response substrate, two different names for the same thing, receptor substrate or response substrate, um, and it's actually uh, isoform 1. So IRS1, insulin response substrate, specifically the insulin receptor substrate 1, is going to also be phosphorylated. And so it gets a phosphate that gets bound onto the molecule, the IRS1, and that turns on or activates IRS1. Now, active IRS1 leads to a cascade of cellular events. Right. So that's what's kind of happening here. Once IRS1 is active, we have a bunch of cellular responses that occur. Uh, one of those responses is going to be the translocation of GLUT4, glucose transporter 4, up to the membrane, that needs to grab onto the glucose and circulate in the bloodstream of the cellular fluid, and that internalizes that glucose to cells that respond to insulin. 
All right, so that's basically one of the ways that we can activate a receptor. We basically turn on the enzyme and we have a series of phosphorylation uh, events that occur leading to a cellular response. We also have receptors that are channels. These are going to form a pore or an opening through the membrane. Normally they are closed <clears throat> or sometimes they are open when they are <clears throat> unbound. And when the hormone comes in and binds, they'll either open if they are closed or they will close if they are open upon interaction with that hormone. So the example that I'm going to give here are acetylcholine channels. So acetylcholine, which is uh, actually a neurotransmitter, um, but it's a great example here. Um, other hormones they'll bind to these channel receptors. And so under a low number of hormones, typically these channels <clears throat> are closed. And then as hormone levels increase, <clears throat> excuse me, we end up with the channel uh, being bound by that hormone and that hormone that changes the function, changes the uh, or changes the form, changes the function. So, for example, in the case of the acetylcholine receptors, the two acetylcholine molecules, this results in the channel switching from a closed conformation to an open conformation. And then we have something that happens, in this case, shown in this picture, sodium rushes into the cell and generates an action. Our third family were the receptors that are coupled to G proteins. And so what happens here is when we increase the concentration of hormones, hormone mo molecules bind to the receptor and initiates what's known as a first messenger interaction. Right, so we basically have um, All right, we'll get to that picture in just a second. We basically have this interaction between the hormone uh, and the receptor. And most of the time, <clears throat> this is going to lead to something like nucleotide cyclization. Nucleotide cyclizing um, is going to be an enzymatic reaction where that enzyme grabs onto a nucleotide, like ATP, removes two of the phosphates, and when you have a uh, ATP molecule that's been converted into AMP inside of an aqueous solution, it's chemically favorable to form a circular or a cyclical structure. So the first messenger upregulates nucleotide cyclizing enzymes. Um, the example that you are all probably familiar with is an enzyme called adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase will bind ATP, <clears throat> remove the two phosphates, deposit AMP back into the cell, which is an aqueous based environment. And the natural uh, tendency is to go to that energetically favorable cyclical form. And so we end up with this molecule called cyclic AMP. So that's kind of this process shown here. Here's adenylate cyclase. This is ATP with our three phosphate groups. And we have this cyclizing that occurs. Okay, so you can see this structure here where when we remove two of our phosphates, that third phosphate interacts now <clears throat> with 
that sixth carbon, uh, I'm sorry, fifth carbon rather on <clears throat> on the uh, on the ribose, um, and creates this kind of cyclical structure. Okay? This reaction here is a um, it, it's another reaction where we actually are undoing that um, that phosphate interaction on the bottom, the interaction between the phosphate and the oxygen. So it's a phosphodiesterase, uh, and that decyclizes. But this is cyclic AMP here. That's what we're about to do. It's a semi-phosphate system. So that phosphodiesterase Can inhibit the effects, inhibits the effects of cyclic AMP uh, and another analog cyclic GMP. And the presence of a phosphodiesterase, you convert the cyclic AMP from cyclic AMP to a molecule called 5 prime AM. Oops. 5 prime AMP. And five time G and so we no longer <clears throat> have that cyclical structure. We've now attached the uh, phosphate on there on that on that fifth carbon, the, the five prime carbon. So this is no longer cyclic AMP, so that would no longer function. You'd have no downstream function in say a cyclic AMP second messenger system. One of the more common Inhibitors of the phosphoesterases are a class of molecules called the methyl xylenes, methyl xanthines. So methyl xanthines inhibit phosphoesterases. And so that means that we can't really ever turn off the cyclic AMP, or we don't effectively turn off the cyclic AMP, and so we initiate a uh, second messenger system. And there's methyl xanthines around that second messenger system continues. Uh, anyone know a really common methyl xanthine? Caffeine. To drink caffeine, inhibit your phosphoesterases. That's the game. Right, so let's um, take a look at second messenger system. We activate the enzyme adenylate cyclase and we begin to produce cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is the second messenger. And cyclic AMP in its active form activates a protein kinase, an enzyme called protein kinase. Typically, we call it protein kinase A. Uh, so protein kinase A, which is going to be associated with cyclic AMP. All right. So... We have two different hormones here, one that's a stimulating hormone, one that's an inhibitory hormone. In the presence of the stimulating hormone, we have our G-linked protein receptor here. Um, so our G-protein receptor, hormone binds on there, and we activate adenylate cyclase, and we utilize GTP converted over GTP. This is uh, basically where the G-protein comes in. So we activate this part of the mechanism to turn on adenylate cyclase using analog of ATP called GTP. Adenylate cyclase takes ATP and converts it into cyclic AMP. This is where we would have the phosphoesterases. If the phosphoesterases were um, active, we would uh, begin to convert cyclic AMP into 5' prime AMP. If we have lots of cyclic AMP that's being produced, Maybe we're inhibiting phosphoesterase, or maybe we have a lot of hormone that's activating a lot of adenylate cyclases. 
patients who are getting large quantities of cyclic AMP, we're going to activate this cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase, which is called protein kinase A. Right? So it's cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase or PKA. It goes from being inactive, loses its regulatory subunit, becomes active. It's now an active protein kinase, and so we know exactly what it's doing, what it's doing. It's phosphorylating proteins, right? That's we can get that right from the name. Kinase always phosphorylates, it's an enzyme that always phosphorylates, and it's acting on other proteins. Now, hopefully you remember this. Whenever you phosphorylate a protein, that phosphorylation process is like turning on a light switch. And we activate that protein in its phosphorylated form. And that ends up turning on enzymes or proteins are being synthesized or muscle contraction will occur or nerve stimulation or a hormone will be secreted. So we have some sort of change that happens, stimulated by our first messenger, propagated by our second messenger. All right, so we'll pick up here um, and deal a little bit more with cyclic AMP um, and, and uh, the PKA next time.